This is it. This is the game for masochists. Limbus Company, or as the local kids call it, Limbussy Company, is one of the most confusing yet intriguing gacha games I've played. After a whole four weeks of playtime, I'm ready to dive into its core gameplay mechanics, lore, monetization, and progression system to let my fellow Limbussers have an informed decision if this game is worth trying out. This will be the second volume of the Atrocious Gacha Review, and this one took a lot more effort to understand than Snowbreak. My name is Psyche, let's begin. Before I start, a limitation with these reviews is that I play as a low spender, and my playtime will be around an entire month before releasing the video. However, that doesn't mean that I will have been able to progress until the very late game, as most gacha games will time gate your progression. So these reviews are less of what I accomplished in one month, and more of what the game lets me accomplish in one month. Good, let's continue. Limbus Company is developed by Project Moon, not to be confused by the Japanese company Type Moon who owns the Fate franchise. Project Moon is a Korean indie game studio that has developed and released three games, with well, this one being their third, all taking place in the same universe. The lore starts with their first game, Lobotomy Corporation. You play as X, an amnesiac manager that oversees a research institution that is attempting to research and harness power from alien-looking abnormalities to produce a form of energy that can cure the inhabitants of the city of a dangerous disease. Accompanied by your AI companion Angela, you stumble your way through this space management simulator, recruiting and managing your employees to keep the abnormalities in check and prevent any, uh, unnecessary casualties. The second game, Library of Ruina, is a direct sequel to Lobotomy Corporation, where the facility has completed its task and now lies abandoned. Angela now found a new role as the head librarian of a massive facility, tasked with gathering knowledge about everything that goes on within the city. Speaking of which, the entire Project Moon universe takes place in what is known as just the city. It is divided into 26 different sectors, all represented by a letter of the alphabet. Each sector is ruled by a major corporate conglomerate where there is a huge gap between the rich and the poor. In Library of Ruina, you play as Roland, a mercenary for hire that has stumbled across the location, and after Angela spares him, you are tasked with accommodating guests that enter the library. Since the place is a treasure trove of knowledge, visitors can request to duel the librarians in combat. If they win, they can pick out a book of their choosing. If they lose, the visitor will be turned into a book and become trapped as part of the library. Unlike the base management gameplay of Lobotomy Corp, Library of Ruina is a turn-based brawler, where you will duel visitors by rolling dice and determining the skill used to combat the opponent. These are just very brief introductions to the games, because the lore and the story get a lot darker and more complex as you go. Both games are single-player and available on Steam, and that brings us to the third entry in this universe. Limbus Company. Unlike the previous two games, this one is a free-to-play, live-service gacha game. You don't need knowledge of the previous two games to enjoy Limbus, but playing them can definitely help. In Limbus Company, you play as Dante, a human-like being with a clock for a head, that awakens in a dark forest having lost their memory. They find themselves in a precarious position as some strangers seemingly want to end Dante's life. That is, until a mysterious bus arrives, and out steps 12 combatants that come to your aid. Unfortunately, it seems the pursuers were far too powerful, and Dante's 12 aides all perish except one. In a flash of desperation, Dante finds out he has the unique ability to turn back time and reconstruct the bodies of his dead companions back to life. Another mysterious fellow with red eyes and a dark suit emerges from the forest, and single-handedly repels Dante's pursuers. He introduces himself as Virgilius, and assigns you as the manager of the 12 sinners that came to your aid. Agreeing to the small chance that they can get their memory back, Dante embarks on a journey across the districts of the city on Virgilius' bidding, with the hopes of remembering who they were and why they have a clock for a head. You are then introduced to the 12 colorful characters of the main cast. These will be the sinners that have complicated backstories that will be revealed across the chapters of the story, and will be accompanying you as your combatants. We have the mellow and intrigued Yi Seng, the knowledge buff Faust, the outgoing Don Quixote, the sadistic Ryoshu, the stone-faced Merceau, the curious and warm Hong Lu, the impulsive hard-headed Heathcliff, the vindictive Ishmael, the laid-back Rodion, the timid and expressive Sinclair, the battle-hardened Otis, and the easy-going Gregory. 
They are dubbed sinners, so you likely can guess they've committed some kind of wrongdoing. But why did they join the Limbus Company, and why are they subjected to Dante's resurrection ability? You will be seeing these 12 sinners a lot, because they are the only characters that are available in the gacha pool. Every new character release is a different version of the sinner from an alternate era or timeline. That just about covers the overview. And now, the second aspect that makes Limbus Company stand out. Behold, gameplay. Now I know what you're thinking. What in how is happening? Well, we're about to explain the highly intricate details of Limbus Company's gameplay. This is by far the most convoluted gameplay system I've seen in a gacha game. While I blame parts of it being hard to understand on my unwillingness to learn, Project Moon is also known for not explaining certain mechanics or explaining them in poor detail. This traces back to the previous games as well. While one month is definitely not enough playtime to have a full grasp of the ins and outs of the mechanics, I hope I'll give a brief overview because the gameplay will come into consideration when we talk about the gacha and progression later. You will form a team of five sinners. This can be more or less depending on the level type. The five sinners must be distinct, meaning even when there are many alt versions of everyone, you can only select one at a time, meaning you cannot put five Ishmaels in the same party. Each sinner has six attack skills, three level ones, two level twos, and one level three. The higher tiers are more effective, but there's only so few of them. On a regular level, two will be displayed at a time for you to select, with the skills cycling out every couple of turns. The core of combat is done through a mechanic called clashing, where a sinner will brawl with an opponent's skill, with the victor dealing their attack skill damage to the loser. Clashing is done by flipping coins either landing on heads or tails that boost one side's clash power. The higher value will win that specific clash. When a clash is won or lost, one coin is taken away from the losing side, and the clash will continue until one side has no coins left. Each attack skill has at least one coin to clash with, if the coin flips heads, the clash power will generally increase based on the skill's coin power. If tails, it will not increase. The floor and the ceiling of a skill's clash power is displayed in the description and during gameplay. And an easy way to visualize it is by basically imagining that the, the number of coins a skill has equals the amount of hits it does. For example, this version of Gregory's tier 1 skill has 2 coins, with a coin power of plus 2. Meaning if a coin lands heads, plus 2 will be added to his clash power. At base, it will have a clash power floor of 3, assuming none of the two coins flip heads. And a ceiling of 7 if both do. Here, Gregory is clashing with an enemy's skill which also has 2 coins. A base power of 2, but a coin power of plus 4, meaning it's got a ceiling of 10 clash power. If the enemy does roll heads on both, then it is impossible for Gregory to win a clash here. On the first strike, both sides roll heads on both coins. Because of an external buff, Gregory reaches a coin power of 9, but it doesn't matter since the enemy rolled a 10. One coin is taken away from Gregory's skill. He now only has a ceiling of plus 2 from rolling 1 heads, and plus 2 from the buff, he has a final ceiling of 7. But luckily, on the second strike, the enemy only rolls 1 heads, so Gregory wins the second strike and one coin is taken away from the enemy. Both sides now only with one coin each, the next strike will determine the winner of the clash. Fortunately, both sides roll heads again, but because of the buff, Gregory wins the strike with a 7-6. The opponent now has no coins left, and the clash ends. When a clash is won, you will then deal damage to the opponent depending on the number of coins you still have left. You will then once again flip said remaining coins, and your final attack damage will increase or stay the same if it lands heads or tails. In this case, Gregory has one of the two coins left in the original skill as one was lost during the clash. He will only roll the coin once, which lands heads, increasing his final attack power to 5. And the enemy is dealt that much damage. The probability of a coin landing heads is determined by something called Sanity Points, or SP for short. Each player has a default sanity, where flipping heads is 50% assuming no other modifiers at an SP of 0 and can have a max sanity of 45, in which case they will have a 95% chance of hitting heads, or a minimum sanity of negative 45, with a measly 5% to hit heads. Even at its extreme ends, you can see that victory or failure are not guaranteed. You can always whiff a 95% heads, or unexpectedly win a 5% tails. 
Each character's sanity level can be typically raised when a clash is won, or an enemy is defeated, and lost when an ally is defeated. Here is Ishmael's tier 2 skill against an enemy. She has 3 coins with a base power of 4 and a coin power of plus 4. She is at 0 sanity, so the chance of flipping heads per coin is around 50-50. The opponent, however, has a skill with negative coin power. So flipping tails in this case will let the skill stay at its original level and heads will actually decrease the power. Again, because of a buff, Ishmael gets plus one final clash power, but rolls heads on none of the three coins, and the enemy rolls a heads, but this is actually good since their final attack is decreased from its base eight to a five. If both sides roll the exact same clash power, then no coin is taken from either side and the clash will simply continue, which is exactly the case here. During the second strike, the enemy rolls tails on both coins, which is actually not good for us since the attack power stays the same. But Ishmael rolls 2 out of 3 heads, bringing her clash power to 12, then plus 1 because of the buff. One coin is taken away from the enemy, however in the third strike the enemy rolls tails again and Ishmael misses all 3 heads. One coin is taken from her, and on the fourth strike, enemy rolls tails, Ishmael rolls 1 heads, bringing the clash power to 8, then plus 1. You can't see it here, but Ishmael's 9 beats out the opponent's 8. The enemy has no coins left, the clash is over, and Ishmael will attack with a remaining 2 coins. Now her SP increased slightly from winning the clash. A character's clash power is also complemented by their offense level, which when compared to that of the opponent, the side with the higher offense level will have their final clash power increased by 1 for every 3 points of offense level access to that of the opponent rounded down. For example, Yi Sang's skill here has an offense level of 28, compared to the opponent's 20. Since he has 8 points access, he will get plus 2 to his final clash power because his offense level contains 2 multiples of 3 and the remaining 2 points are rounded down. The chance of a clash victory is calculated by the game, display with hopeless, struggling, neutral, favored, or dominating, from least likely to win to most likely. Note that while you can let the game auto decide the best move based on the clash win rate or damage, it doesn't always factor in every nuance. In most campaign stages, each sinner will automatically target an enemy, and you will simply have to choose which of the two skills you want them to use by dragging the combo chain across the board. During some stages like bosses, you will have to manually select which enemy you want each sinner to target, creating that extra layer of complexity. Alternatively, each sinner also has one of three defensive skills, block, evade, or counter. They can be activated at any turn by tapping on the sinner's portrait. If you believe a clash can't be won and there's no alternative way out, you can try a defense skill to negate damage. Sometimes, characters are actually built around their defense skill, such as this version of Otis, who aggroes enemies to target her, and with a good evade skill, she can take on powerful enemy attacks while boosting her own power on a successful evade. Each character also has a stat called Speed, which is randomly selected from a range every turn. Speed basically determines the order in which attacks will take place. If a sinner has a higher speed level than an enemy's, they can quote-unquote intercept an attack. Where since they technically will attack faster, they can redirect an enemy clash to them instead of who they were originally targeting. This means characters with higher speed generally have more control over the battlefield. But this is not guaranteed, as you can always low roll on the range, and the enemy can high roll. There are three damage types in the game, Slash, Pierce, and Blunt, with each center weak to and resisting a certain type. And the same goes for the opponent. There are also seven affinities, each represented by the seven sins, except Greed is replaced by Gloom. Each attack skill used will generate an instance of that particular affinity currency, displayed on the right side of the screen. Having enough can trigger certain passive abilities, or better yet, unleash powerful skills known as Ego. Ego skills are kind of like a character's ultimate. One sinner can be equipped with five at a time, each representing the cost and power level. There is Zayn, Teth, He, Wow, and Aleph. Each level increasing the strength and the cost of using said Ego skill. Using Ego will cost a number of the seven affinities, as well as a bit of the user's sanity level. The more expensive the Ego, the more resources and sanity it will drain. I should note here that there's actually no Aleph Ego in the game at the moment, but that will change in the future. Despite being separated into five tiers, Ego all share the same rarity. It's just that some Egos are more expensive to use in combat than others. You can unleash an Ego skill by holding down on a character's portrait. It's helpful if, if you wish to apply a certain buff or debuff, or if a clash has low chances of winning, you can change the hopeless text to a dominating one. 
Not only are you winning the clash, you also get to deal a powerful blow to the enemy. Alternatively, you can also hold down the Eagle skill card to perform an overclock, which consumes more resources but amplifies its effect and changes it in some way. If a sinner reaches negative sanity levels, there is a chance that they will use a corroded version of their ego instead, which can do something very counterintuitive, albeit enhancing its abilities. Overclock and ego will help you retain the corroded ego's abilities but still being able to target only enemies with it. I can't show much of this off since I only got one ego skill during the month that I played, but ego is an amazing way to balance risk and reward and turn the tides in your favor. And lastly, we will talk about passive abilities. Each character has two sets of passive abilities. One when they are physically participating in battle, and another when they are not. This means each team will technically consist of all 12 sinners, but only a select few of them will be fighting during a level. This also means that even if you don't plan on using a character for combat, you can still put them in the team if they have a suitable support passive. Each passive is separated by two types, either by owning a certain amount of sin affinity in your currency pool, or by chaining together a number of a specific sin affinity in an attack chain. It's true there's quite some thinking involved when it comes to plays and team building. But at its core, since flipping coins is still percentage-based, there is absolutely an element of randomness involved. Sometimes, even if you make the right moves, you're just not lucky, and you will have to retry or make some adjustments to your strategy. Now, I have combed through so many online guides and tutorials, I ran level after level in the past couple weeks, and there is so much to the game that I still don't know, and so much I haven't explained yet. These are the core mechanics of the game, and understanding them is vital to know how character progression and team building work later on. Limbus Company is a classic case of hard to learn, hard to master. Next up, we will cover progression. The remaining sections of this review will receive ratings based on how well I think the game handles them. Just like the previous Snowbreak video, it will be ranked for below, within, or above expectations. Progression in Limbus is one of the oddest experiences I've had in a gacha game. For one, there is no gold currency, like Mora from Genshin, credits from Nikkei, QP from FGO. Any upgrades to your characters will take the respective materials, but you do not need anything else aside from that. Speaking of which, Limbus does not have an artifact or gearing system. The only two, technically three ways, to progress your characters are leveling and up tying. Leveling is straightforward. You use XP tickets to increase your skill's power level. The level cap is 45 at the moment, though this can increase in the future. Up ties are kind of like character ascensions, where you will gain new skills and passives. Up tying can go to a maximum of four levels and takes a resource called Threads to complete. The last uptie level, also taking another currency called Ego Shards, but we will cover that later. However, unlike Genshin or FGO, uptying is a separate upgrade from levels, meaning you can have a character at uptie 4, but at level 1. Because of those passives and new skills, it's generally considered a good idea to prioritize uptying a level versus just leveling them. The third indirect way to progress a character is by upgrading their ego skill, which also takes the same resource of threads, through a process called thread spinning, also maxing out at thread spun level 4, same as uptime. And that's it actually. There's no RNG gearing system, no complex webs of materials to farm. What's even more surprising is that there's no duplicate or limit break system. You cannot power up a character or ego by pulling more copies. One copy is all you need. If you pull a character for the first time, that character will be the strongest version they can be. We will go over what happens if you do pull more copies in the gacha later on, but as of now, you can get a feel that the game is actually quite skill-based, as there's no way to just pay your way to get the max limit broken version of a character with beefed up stats. The next main method of progression is the battle pass. Every other section in this video will tie into it, as it seems to have a big emphasis on the player base. Every season lasts for around 4 months with the Battle Pass extending all the way to level 120, which also gives additional rewards if you level up beyond that. The game is currently in Season 4, with three seasons spanning across the first year of the game's launch. And I was actually able to catch the tail end of the first anniversary event when I started. The main difference in Limbus's Battle Pass is that there are some pretty significant rewards in the track, like season-specific ego abilities that do have impact on your gameplay. While the Battle Pass can seem grindy, it feels to me personally that Project Moon values your loyalty, rather than your money. There are some nuances to the Battle Pass that I will cover next, but in terms of overall game progression, Limbus gets an above expectation rating from me. 
The simplistic upgrade system, with the lack of limit breaking, makes it very natural for players to beef up their rosters, without any RNG system that can make it unfair or frustrating. During my one month playtime, I was able to clear the main story up to until partially of the fourth chapter, and only during the end section of chapter 3 where I started to feel challenged, like actually adjusting my team members based on enemy weaknesses or reading up on the dungeon mechanics and understanding how each battle worked. Your choices become more nuanced, each clash has more weight, and you have to rely on your knowledge of the game rather than letting the game decide for you. My final playtime clocks in at around 25 hours, accounting for both PC and mobile. Next up, Gacha and Monetization. Gacha currency takes on the form of a red rose icon called Lunacy. One pull in the Gacha is 130 Lunacy, but there's actually a daily pull that costs 13, but you need to use paid Lunacy. There are only three rarities in Limbus, represented by the amount of zeros, but I'll just list them as 1, 2, and 3 stars. The rates are as follows. A 1.3% to get an Ego skill, which only has one rarity, a 2.9% for a 3 star, 12.8% for a 2 star, and the remaining 83% for a 1 star. Every 10 pulls will guarantee a 2 star or above. When you pull an Ego, that Ego will be removed from the Ego pool. So every Ego you pull is guaranteed to be one you don't already have. Since there aren't a lot of Egos in the game yet, if you manage to exhaust the entire pool, then that 1.3% will be subtracted from the overall rates, in which the rates for the characters will be adjusted as follows. 3% for a 3 star, 13% for a 2 star, and 84% for a 1 star. There is a pity system of 200 pulls for a rate up character, but just be warned as it's tracked separately across banners. So if you don't reach the pity before the banner expires, the mileage you saved up is gone. However, you do get threads equal to the mileage you had, so at least you're not getting nothing. There is a 50% coin flip for the 3 star to be the rate up, pretty much similar to other gotchas out there. Whenever you pull a copy of a character you already have, you will get Ego Shards of that specific sinner. The shards can be used in the Dispense menu, which is the game's other mileage system. 400 of a sinner's Ego Shards can be exchanged for a specific 3 star or 2 star from past seasons. While old Egos and characters are added to the standard gacha pool, it can be random. So saving up Ego Shards is good for latecomers to the game, since you can guarantee certain characters from the past. The main conclusion I got after reviewing the gacha rates is that this game really hates whales. There's no limit break system, so whales cannot gain an advantage by pulling more copies of characters. Sure, you have your usual packages of materials that you can pay for, but it's nothing that a free-to-play or low spender can't accomplish. Something else is that unlike Nikkei or FGO, where only half the gacha currency you buy count as paid currency, all of the lunacy you buy count as paid, which is very generous you'll be swimming in those daily pulls for 90% off. In addition, there are two tiers to the 30 days Welkin system, one for three bucks and another for seven bucks. You can buy both to double up on the rewards. What's more, you don't have to physically log in every day to claim them. The lunacy is added to your mailbox on server reset, so you can technically come back 30 days later and all the supplies from the past month will be waiting for you. The premium track of the Battle Pass costs 1300 Lunacy, but a version for more if you want a unique banner to show off and 10 levels as a head start. But if you also look in the cash shop, there is a special package for $11 that gives you exactly 1300 paid Lunacy. So the Battle Pass is an even purchase. And considering that each season is 4 months, that 11 bucks is getting you quite some value. You can see that Limbus has a monetization system that's fairly low spender friendly and no way to pay your way to gain a significant advantage. Because of this, Project Moon has earned my respect, and absolutely deserves an above expectations rating for the gacha and the monetization. Though I do want to give a small warning. In life service games, it's very beneficial to capture whales, as they make up the bulk of your revenue. If you make the game too free to play friendly, then there's no reason to whale, while you will have a dedicated player base that may not generate you the most revenue, your game is not going to be swimming in sales. Limbus will likely never reach Nikkei's income because you just can't whale as much versus in that game. But hey, the game is doing fine financially. If they don't have a problem with it, then neither do I. Limbus has a cartoonish yet detailed art style, almost resembling something like Don't Starve. Of course, I understand that Project Moon at its core is still just an indie studio, so accounting for the scope of the game, this is fine. It probably doesn't take long to figure out that the universe that Limbus takes in is a dark and foreboding place, with depictions of violence and suggested gory images thrown in here and there. And that's totally fine for a player that specifically wants something a bit darker from a gacha game. 
One thing I find is that in any gacha or any live service game, the main cast has to be likable. Since any new characters cannot be anyone except for the different versions of the 12 sinners, each would have to be unique in their own way, but still playing off the personality of that sinner. For what it's worth, I obviously can't show much of the ego or character animations with my minuscule roster one month, but they are generally well animated. The UI can get pretty messy during combat, but it's something you'll just get used to. Not to mention hearing the constant satisfying dings of coins flipping heads. Unlocking the third uptight level of a 3 star will also unlock a new illustration with live 2D animation. In case you haven't realized, Belimbus does not deliver on the fan service element. There's no raunchy dialogue or events or characters wearing suggestive clothing. Sorry, but it's over for Nikkei Bros. If you walk into Olympus expecting fan service, you're not going to find any of it, which is actually what fans slated as one of its strong points. There's a handful of gacha game players that specifically don't like it when a game relies too much on fan service, as it's easy to dismiss it as having all style and no substance. After all, your game only sells because of sex appeal. I'll likely make a future discussion video going over this topic about what I think of this debate. But for Project Moon, this is the style they went for, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The story is also fully voiced, but only Korean voiceover is available, which I know can be a deal breaker for some. Speaking of the story, while I wasn't able to get through the entirety of the main story so far, which extends to Chapter 6 with the latest update, I have heard many good things about the later ones. There isn't too much to say about Limbus's presentation, other than it's very dark and stylized. I didn't have any problems understanding the UI or reading what's happening on screen. I blame it mostly on the complicated game mechanics, and I don't think the game is intentionally trying to confuse you. Overall, there's nothing wrong with the way Limbus is presented, it gets a within expectations rating in this department. Limbus's new player honeymoon period wore off faster than I expected for a gacha game. Typically, the game will shower you with rewards when you start and only start to dry up as you play more. Sure, the first two chapters were pretty much pushovers, and you don't need to grind a single bit to beat them, but that all changes when you reach chapter 3, where there is a fairly big difficulty spike that demands you to come back after you've established a bit of your roster. The first of the farming modes unlock as you beat chapter 2, and it's almost as if the game is telling you that your smooth journey is over, and now it's time to grind. Using the time-replenished resource called Encephalon, you can package 20 units of it into a module, which is then used to farm certain modes. And it doesn't seem to have a cap. You do not need any other currency for the conversion, such as Genshin's Crystal Fireflies to condense resin. Just logging in will do. However, because of the cap for the time resource filling up before 24 hours, you do have to come back at least twice a day to not let it overflow. But you can just create some modules before going to bed, then dip out in 2 minutes. There's no auto battle feature in combat, so you do have to manually select your moves, though there are two buttons that you can press to let the game auto select plays to maximize your clash win rate, or maximize damage. Though it's not perfect, as it can select sinners to clash with weak enemies while leaving the stronger attacks completely unguarded, since it will technically count as giving you the highest win rate. If you had an established roster, you can kind of put the game on autopilot just to let the game select moves for you, but you still have to press initiate to start combat every turn. In late game, there's also a separate mode called Refraction Railway, which rotates based on the game's season. It's basically an extra difficult challenge mode that you can do to earn some rewards. The most noticeable one is a unique banner that you can display on your character profile for bragging rights. I have not progressed to the point where this mode unlocks, but I generally don't have a problem with minor cosmetic items like this being locked behind late game progression. And now we move on to one of the major reasons players state why they quit this game. The grind. It can be brutal. Upon completion of Chapter 2, you unlock the modes to farm XP tickets and threats. Each run will cost you two modules, but after beating it once, you do have the option to skip it instantly to get the rewards. However, you have to spend four modules for that, so you spend double the amount of modules, but get this you only get 1.5 times of the rewards. And I really gotta wonder, but why? It's almost as if by Project Moon standards, choosing convenience is like taking the easy way out. If you use the skip feature, you will be farming with 50% less efficiency. I know Korean games tend to be a bit more grindy, but even Nikkei's dailies can be considered as taking a bit longer to do than the conventional gacha game. But I don't understand why the skip feature is here if you're just gonna punish players for using it. This effectively means if you absolutely want to min-max your account, you have to manually complete the levels each time. 
This is the same for the Threads level, which rotates every day for the week, though there is also a 3x daily drop bonus, so you're incentivized to run this 3 times daily. Though only assuming that you actually need Threads, which is not going to be for all the time. But this is not where the true grind lies. The true late game grind for Glimbus Company is for the Mirror Dungeon, which is kind of like a roguelike mode where you will lock in a team of 12 sinners, then battle across multiple floors to gain helpful artifacts that give buffs. And your total reward is determined by how much of it you completed. There are nodes where you have to pass a skill check that is favorable for a specific sin affinity, and shop nodes where you can heal or merge your artifacts to get something stronger. It sounds fun on paper, and it is, for the first couple times you do it. It almost reminds me of a card builder like Slay the Spire. Lots of ways to get creative, and while there is a hard mode as well, I haven't been able to unlock it during the first month of playing. There is a 3 times weekly reward bonus, so technically you just have to do 3 runs a week at the minimum, but the rewards for running through it is immense. With the daily bonus, you instantly get 5 levels in the battle pass, and some other goodies. Now you might not think this is a big deal, but something I noticed is that the community may suggest grinding out the mirror dungeon, since if you max out the battle pass, every level you earn in excess gives you something called a shard box, where you can select a sinner's ego shards to obtain. If you go this route, you can potentially get hundreds of ego shards, and those can be used to exchange for a copy of a previously released 3 or 2 star in the dispense menu. Unlike the 200 poles pity, each copy of a sinner or ego in this menu costs 400 ego shards of that respective sinner. Receiving the mirror dungeon rewards will cost you some modules, but something unexpected is that when you use lunacy to refill your energy, it refills the entire thing instead of partially. This creates a scenario where if you absolutely wanted to min-max, you will go through the dungeon at least once a day. This is a tall order, as a run can take quite a long time, and yes, when you get a late game roster, you can kinda autopilot it, but there's still no autoplay, so you still have to actively pay attention to the screen. If you watched my reverse 1999 video, I mentioned something called the 20 minute rule when it comes to farming dailies and gacha games. Completing your daily tasks should not exceed 20 minutes. Assuming you don't auto battle the threats or XP tickets, running a mirror dungeon once, it will likely take you quite a while to beat. Now, this is going to enter a bit of a grey zone, because of course, Limus Company players will argue that, no, the game isn't grindy, you don't need to farm mirror dungeon every day, and that's absolutely true. Since you can just convert your energy into modules, you technically don't have to use it every day. Some players only run mirror dungeon about 3 times a week, or however many times they feel like it, and that's okay. If you want to skip the grind and auto battle at the cost of losing efficiency, yeah, that's alright too. It's a little bit flexible in that regard. But what I'm trying to say here is, if you dedicate yourself to the grind, it will pay off, and there are very good incentives to do so. If we consider that grinding out the mirror dungeon can level out the battle pass to get ego shards, it is a fantastic way to guarantee characters and egos that you want. It's arguable that replenishing Enkephalon with Lunacy is actually a worthwhile thing to do, even for free to place. The only thing it'll cost is your sanity. After all, rolling the gacha can be random. Sometimes you're just not lucky. So why not make better use of your resources by guaranteeing items you want by grinding? Overall, due to the lack of autoplay features and the game seemingly punishing you for trying to take the easy way out by skipping battles, I definitely felt the grind when I played, at least noticeably more so than other gacha games. I will still give a within expectations rating for late game content, but I do want to state that this is one of the major aspects that has negatively impacted my experience. I am dedicating an entire section talking about FOMO elements, as I believe if a player can jump into the game at any time, then they should be able to participate in the majority of content and should not be locked out of certain rewards just because they don't have an established account yet. Bonus points if the game makes past content accessible, so that even newcomers can live through the moments that makes the game so great. So how does Limbus Company handle FOMO elements? Well, there are some events that are fully voiced side stories, and even when they've ended, most of them were added to the main storyline as interlude chapters. So you can still go through the story, though there's no way to skip it. If you just wanted to read the next main story chapter, you do have to go through these interludes. I don't really have a problem with this, making past content available is quite generous. And yeah, it may seem like a detour at times, but hey, more content is never bad. I also talk about how characters and ego skills are added to the general pool, as well as the dispense menu, purchasable with ego shards. 
The only issue here is that there are certain content that could have been earned through the Battle Pass, like Seasonal Eagle skills that do have quite substantial gameplay implications. Since you will have to buy them with Eagle Shards while the players before you used to get it for free, that does technically put you at a disadvantage as time goes on and more of them are added to the dispense pool. As of now, the game has not given out any kind of Eagle Shard voucher that you can use to exchange a free item. But hey, the game is only a year old, so that can change. However, as of currently, every character and Eagle skill from the past are available. You just have to grind for it, or save up for a while. I can give Limbus the Within Expectations rating for FOMO as well. For its first year runtime, I'd say it's doing a decent job of preserving past content in a way that new players can still experience it, but we'll have to go through some extra steps. We arrive at the last stop. How does Limbus create variety in its release content, and how frequently do new content drop? Well, last year, they did release a roadmap of sorts detailing the new content that will be arriving. Project Moon seems to be quite responsive when it comes to player feedback, as I believe they put out a notice for a schedule update once every week, usually addressing small bugs, but occasionally dropping new content in the form of events or characters. For the scale of the game and its company, I'd say a substantial monthly update is quite a nice look. When the game launched, the main story only went up to Chapter 3, but since then they have released up to Chapter 6 just recently, with the later chapters taking up more runtime and are generally better written, in addition to being padded out by major side stories. Each season ran for around 4 months, all came with new characters and egos for you to play with. Some of them earnable through the Battle Pass. Each season also coming with a new version of Mirror Dungeon, as well as a seasonal Refraction Railway Challenge. Overall, I didn't notice any issues regarding how content was paced. Without sitting through an entire season's runtime, I thought the content I got to experience was quite acceptable. And I didn't notice anything shady or bad with the development cycle. A boring end to the list of sections, but variety and content frequency gets a within expectations rating from me. Limbus Company almost feels like a single-player game disguised as a gacha. Being pioneers in creative game design, Project Moon is able to create a combat system that went way further beyond what I expected in a gacha game. You really do have to learn its system slowly to progress. I wanted to learn it, and I wanted to master it. I wanted to read more and find out about each sinner's backstories, and it felt immensely satisfying when I pulled off a huge play that paid off big time. The overly simplistic upgrade system made it so that I didn't have to keep track of which materials I needed, and I knew exactly how to farm it to make my characters stronger. The game is incredibly generous with free-to-play and low spenders, with a flexible leveling system and a lack of limit break mechanics. And you can practically get every character and ego in the game, assuming you do some grinding and play regularly. Limbus Company gets an 8 out of 10 rating from me. It's one of the most unique gacha experiences I've seen, and if you're someone that enjoys a story with darker tones and a stylistic cartoonish design, this is the game for you. Now to answer a very subjective and personal question I have for this game. Am I in or am I out? Do I see myself playing this for the foreseeable future, or do I call it quits? Well, I wanted to like this game. There's so much I learned in the past four weeks, and so much I haven't seen yet. I wanted to see more versions of the Sinners. I wanted to read Chapter 5 of the main story that I heard many good things about. I wanted to take my time to invest and level my characters to build diverse and interesting teams. But I don't think I can bring myself to do that. When I see that I'm not doing something in the most efficient way in a game, it bothers me. With a lot of these gacha games, I see daily and weekly tasks as chores. I don't enjoy doing them, but I understand that in order to progress as efficiently as I can, I have no other choice. The game punishes you for taking the convenience route, and I just don't have all the time in the world to commit to all the grind I have to do. Of course, some people will just tell me, then just don't grind. Simply do the main story, play at your own pace, progress a bit slower, but you will be happier with the experience. But that's just it. If I don't see all of my dailies completed, or the weekly bonuses exhausted, I would feel incomplete. As if I'm not playing these types of games to the fullest. So instead of dealing with all the pressure, why not just not deal with it at all. This is not my recommendation for people to not play the game. It's a very personal reason and not representative of most players. It felt like I was fighting an uphill battle trying to play catch up to all the past characters and egos I missed. It's true that Project Moon seemed to value player loyalty, and if you stick by the game and commit your time to it, you will be rewarded. But I just don't think I have the time for it. For that reason, regrettably, I'm out.
The Project Moon rabbit hole was one of the most intriguing ones I've fallen into, and I absolutely do want to learn more about it, about all the districts of the city and all the vices that happen within them, which is why I'll probably just play Library of Runa at some point instead. It's a purely single-player experience with all content permanently available. It's an excellent outlook into the lore of the Project Moon universe with the gameplay system similar to Limbus's. The truth is, the grind eventually got to me. I enjoy my game with the company, but I think it's just not for me. Thank you for tuning in to the second volume of the Atrocious Gotcha Review. This video took an immense amount of time to research and edit. So if you enjoyed it, leave a like and let me know of your thoughts on Limbus Company. How long have you been playing it for? And how have you managed to cope with the grind? I haven't decided the next game to cover just yet, and I'm always looking for suggestions in the comments. That's it for now. As always, have fun with the game.